We're just so fortunate and grateful to have you here, Steve. We're really delighted to hear what you've got to say. You electrified our group last time. We're looking forward to more of the same. Well, thank you very much. I'm, I'm really glad, Jim, you didn't uh, go back to uh, Google or any place and check some of those figures <laughs> to be sure that they were, in fact, uh, true. But uh, I'll accept what, uh, what you said. Uh, it, it is certainly a pleasure, always a pleasure, to come back to England, even though many, many, many years ago, you people threw my family out of Scotland for stealing <laughs> cattle and probably some other nasty things. But uh, anyway, I, I still do welcome the opportunity to come back. And, uh, Dr. Mike is here somewhere. He took us on a, a great tour today, and, and all of you, from Michelle and Jim, and yeah, on and on. Uh, it's really been a great week, so we've enjoyed it. Uh, so thank you very much. I'll see you next year. <laughs> oh, do, am I supposed to do something? Yeah. Well, um, some of you may have been at my uh, talk earlier this week, and uh, certainly the academics uh, know that uh, it is uh, now expected more and more uh, when a, an academic gives a lecture or when you write a paper, you disclose your contacts, so the disclosures that you've had in, in recent years. to. Uh, so that people can say, oh my goodness, a cancer foundation for life. You mean you're trying to cause cancer? You're working on things to, no, that's not it. But, uh, and then of course, research funding uh, from, uh, you know, we've been blasted a lot for taking, for the university taking money from the Coca-Cola company to fund research. And Jim Whitehead, the executive VP of American College of Sports Medicine, taught me decades ago the answer to this corporate funding thing is transparency and control. You say where the money came from, but they don't control what you do with it. You control the research. Or at ACSM, when Gatorade funded a lecture, we selected who, who gave the lecture. So anyway, here are my disclosures, and uh, you've already seen the, the topic. So I'm going to start with this. I was really so pleased when in 2012, the Lancet, and then they did repeat that in 2016, but they devoted the entire issue before the Olympic Games, and where were the Games in 2012? Uh, <laughs> you people remember those, but uh, they devoted the entire issue to physical activity, exercise science. Uh, we had, uh, had a big meeting and a seminar uh, in London, and I was privileged to work with uh, Professor Ayman Lee on this topic. Uh, you know, how big a problem is physical inactivity? Well, you know what I think it is. I think it's the biggest public health problem of this century. And here are the findings. What we did for this paper, and we had, again had uh, outstanding scientists working on it, we collected data sets from many places around the world, did extensive analyses, we were trying to be conservative, and believe me, the editor of The Lancet kind of forces you to be a little conservative. But here's what we came up with, that uh, pretty high percentage of non-communicable diseases are attributable to inactivity. So that's uh, quite a 5.3 million a year, and that's actually a little more than the figures show for smoking. So now, is, there a, is that a statistically significant difference? You know, who cares? Uh, I do think inactivity is a bigger problem, but uh, it certainly is a big problem in public health. And in the paper, and in fact the estimates, from the paper that Dr. Imean Lee led in, in The Lancet, uh, I think is an underestimate of the true effect of inactivity on health outcomes. The reason is all the data that we looked at for that paper were self-reported physical activity and mortality and health outcomes. Now what's the problem with that? Well, you ask me my physical activity, by golly, I know, I can tell you exactly, you know, number of steps. But there are some people in here, like the guy sitting over there, he might exaggerate a little bit if you ask him about his act. No, you know, I'm teasing, but uh, some people don't remember, some people do exaggerate a bit. So it's not as accurate a measure. So here's a report, another Lee, I love these Lee people, this DC Lee, duck. Chul Lee, who's worked with me for uh, many years, brilliant young scientist. And we published this several years ago uh, in the big database that I'll be talking more about uh, that I've been working on for uh, two or three decades. We have data on the, the, medical, ex uh, self, uh, the medical records of a person's self-reported physical activity. So that's here. But in this 
population. We also have maximal exercise tests in the laboratory to determine cardiorespiratory fitness. Now you can lie to my questionnaire, you can't really lie to my treadmill. We're pushing you because we know what your heart rate is, we know whether you're getting up to maximum. So in this group, and you, you can all read, I know, uh, this is a fairly large group at that time of men and women followed up for quite a few years and you see the number of uh, deaths. And I think I mentioned this the other day for those of you who attended that lecture. You know, we do have more men than women in the study. And that's not intentional, that's just the people that signed up to come to this clinic for examinations. I wish it were the other way around. We had more women than men. Not just because I like women, well, I do like women, yes, but uh, uh, because you women are just lousy subjects for big epidemiological studies. The darn women won't die. And if you want to look at something in deaths, you've got to have dead bodies to count. Oh, epidemiology is so much fun, counting dead bodies. And the men are much better at that, so we actually should have more women. But anyway, we don't. Uh, so, uh, and uh, I'll come back to that probably a, a little later. But note that here, uh, in low, moderate, and high self-reported physical activity, all these trends are statistically significant. <coughs> Highly active women were, what, um, almost 20% uh, less likely to die than the inactive ones. About the same thing for the men. But now look at the measured fitness. Much bigger reduction in risk. Double reduction in risk. Why? Because it's a more accurate measure. At least that's my view. So those data come from the Aerobic Center of the Longitudinal Study, again, that I've been working on for 35 years or so. Uh, I mean, the database I now have has 80,000 patients in it. This is a very extensive medical examination. People come from all over the world, actually, all 50 states, come to this clinic for a preventive medical examination. And each exam takes three or four hours. Each doctor in this clinic sees maybe three, four patients a day. That's how extensive it is, how thorough the exam, the laboratory, uh, the medical exam, and, and the like. And again, cardiorespiratory fitness, a thing that's uh, kept my interest. So uh, this database, we found mortality through 2003, and so forth. So the first report uh, we published on cardiorespiratory fitness and uh, mortality uh, was in quite a few years ago. Some of you weren't even born then, uh, 1989. But note that for women and for men, get out of the low fitness category. Just get out of that low fit and get in the moderate. You don't have to be a triathlete. Get out of the moderate and look at the reduction in risk for men and women. Now, if you're thinking, some of you are saying, well, what is low fitness? The way we've defined it from the beginning, from this maximal exercise test, low is the least fit, that is the lowest treadmill times, uh, in each age gender category. So it's the bottom 20%. Moderate is the next 40%, and although we call this high, I keep wondering if we should, you know, it's 40% of the distribution. And the risk is a little bit lower from moderate, but get out of that low fit group. It's really good for you if you do that. And here's a little, uh, well, another from the same, same data, but showing it over a maximal metabolic equivalence. I think most of you are probably exercise science types, but uh, not all. Uh, uh, one met is your energy expenditure at rest. Two mets is your energy expenditure uh, double rest, which would be kind of what I'm doing now. Two mets. Three mets would be walking like this. So those are the different measures of METs, uh, maximal METs on the test. And again, you can see the big difference is getting out of that bottom group, uh, at least there. So of course, we published that, and uh, criticisms came, well, yes, but that's fitness, cardiorespiratory fitness, and that's genetic. How, how does that matter? It's genetic. So I do have a question now. I like to give quizzes when I talk to academic groups. Can you name me anything we can measure in human beings that doesn't have a genetic component? There are some people, like this guy, who have abnormal tops of their heads. This is supposed to be what normal guys are, yeah? 
And then there are normal height people, and they're genetic freaks, like some in this room. I think I spot a couple of them here. So yeah, everything has a genetic component. Uh, but uh, the, the world authority on uh, the, the genetics of uh, physical act, uh, fitness is Professor Claude Bouchard, and he's looked at this extensively. And actually, the percentage of fitness that is explained by genetics is less than the percentage of your body weight and height and you know, a number of other things that, that he's looked at. So I thought, well, okay, if, uh, if the fitness does have a genetic component, one way to address that would be, well, what about changing fitness? So you're low fit, suppose you change. Does that reduce your risk? So a few years later, we had, again, count up those dead bodies, got enough deaths that we could look at, uh, look at people that had two exams, and then they, they were alive at the second exam. It is really hard to do a treadmill test on a dead person. So they were all alive at the end of, the, of their last exam. It could have been their 10th exam, or, but at least their first and last exam, and then follow them to see who died. So, and this is a, a database based on men. So they were classified as fit or unfit, just the unfit or either moderate or high, and you can see the categories. Those who just were always unfit, those who improved, and those who were fit at both exams. So here are uh, data from that report, again from JAMA 1995. Most of you were born by 1995, right? Yeah, no babies in here. Uh, so showing by uh, different age groups and those categories, the never fit improvers and always fit, here are the death rates per 10,000 man years. Ooh, get out of that bottom group. Even for the, yeah, there are a lot of people here in, in this age, age group. Get out of that bottom group. It's good for you. And it's also good for those of you up here in this upper group. Get out. And I think that it's, the effect is, well, I think it's an effect, uh, the association across age groups, that, that's kind of an important finding as well. I think fitness is good. And how do you get to be fit? Be physically active, yeah. So then, and we went on to look at fitness and other health outcomes like cardiovascular disease, again, 96 in, in JAMA, cardiovascular disease death rates, okay, women, low, moderate, high, men, low, moderate, high. I think I mentioned this the other day for those of you who are at the lecture, and uh, you know that there are some people, Jim, who think I'm kind of nasty and they don't like me. And they say, well, Blair doesn't do any new research. He just makes new slides. They all look the same. Well, it is kind of consistent what we keep finding. So get out of that low fit group, your risk of, if you're a woman, risk of uh, dying of cardiovascular disease, it's cut more than half. It didn't cut that, quite that much in men, but a substantial reduction. All these things are highly statistically significant, of course. And I haven't mentioned this earlier, I think virtually all the slides I'll show you, the data are statistically adjusted. I work with a bunch of really smart statisticians and epidemiologists, and we know how to adjust for other variables. So they're adjusted for these characters and, you know, all other risk factors. And also in that report, uh, uh, <clears throat> or maybe this is a different, but anyway, uh, the fitness and uh, other and, and risk factors. So you could all name, this, at least in those days, these were the three risk factors that were uh, recognized for mortality, cardiovascular disease, and such. So these guys had none of the traditional risk factors. These guys had any two or all three of the risk factors. And I don't, I don't burden the slide here with lots of statistical, but all of these trends are highly statistically significant. But I think that to me, the most interesting part of this slide has always been that these guys who smoke, have high blood pressure and high cholesterol, but are high fit, that death rate is about uh, 23, 24 per 10,000. The guys who have no other risk, none of these risk factors, but are low fit, their death rate is 30 per 10. So you're better off smoke, have high blood pressure, high cholesterol, but be high fit. 
Now, again, not as many women in the study, and the, you know, we couldn't separate them into as many categories, and the data are you know, not uh, quite as uh, uh, trends and as statistically or as clear, but the findings are the same. I don't know whether this one's statistically significant or not, but these women with other risk factors who are at least moderately fit, more likely to survive than those who were low fit and did not have the other risk factors. You're beginning to maybe see why I think inactivity, which is what causes low fitness, is the biggest public health problem of our time. It wasn't a problem, actually, back when you people throw, threw my family out of Scotland. You know, we all had to work hard back in those days, and it was, uh, there were no unfit people. But anyway, okay, let's uh, take a minute or two and look at uh, uh, some other uh, health outcomes. For example, breast cancer mortality. Uh, yeah, trend looks pretty much the same, doesn't it? For the women, uh, it's, not, it's not a huge number, only 68 breast cancer deaths during follow-up, but it is a significant uh, trend. Get out of the low-fit group, reduce your risk of dying of breast cancer by, what is that, uh, 35%. And again, adjusted for all kinds of things. Uh, incident hypertension. So we're not talking about dead bodies now, you have to measure this. Uh, incident hypertension, and th these are data uh, from uh, women. And again, not a huge group and followed for well, a while, but 157 did develop hypertension and again, adjusted for all these other things. Again, significant inverse trend. Get out of the low fit group or the, the low fit group, much more likely, what, 40% more likely to develop hypertension. And remember, this medical exam is very extensive. Physi you know, physicians see three patients a day, everything done in the lab, and so we knew whether or not they had hypertension at the start of this observation, and whether or not they really had it uh, at, uh, at, at the follow-up. Oh yeah, this is uh, severity of, of hypertension in uh, uh, a group of men that, uh, you know, again, they complete the medical history, uh, they've had, uh, had medical exams. So had, did they have physician-diagnosed hypertension? So all of these guys had physician-diagnosed hypertension. And then we follow them up to see who lives and who dies. And uh, then when they came back for this, this next exam, uh, some of them had their hypertension that could control. Uh, some were still in stage one hypertension, some in stage two. But look at the, you know where I'm going with this pointer, don't you? <laughs> Those still in stage two hypertension who were high fit were less likely to die of cardiovascular, or not, this is not death, these are cardiovascular disease events, and those who blood pressure was controlled, but were low fit. So doctor, I think there may be some doctors here, you have patients with hypertension, you treat them, get their blood pressure un under control, good for you, but don't congratulate yourself too much until you know what their fitness is as well. Because it's possible that they're in this group. Ah, no, fitness? Can you measure their fitness? Sure. Steve, can you tell me what exam year is, please? Oh, yes, I, sure. I'm sorry, I should have gone into more exam. This is uh, more details. This is a modified bulky protocol. They start on the level at, God, how much? Can anyone tell me? It's uh, two point something miles an hour, I think. And then at, uh, after one minute, it's, I'll have to send you the paper. But it's a, it's a standard treadmill test protocol, starting on the level at one speed, and then the treadmill goes up kind of like every minute, and then at some point the speed also increases, so it's in increasing the workload. So it's, and it's, it's to maximum. They go until they collapse and fall off the treadmill, or no, wait a minute, and we have the maximal heart rates, and they say, doctor, I just can't go on any further, uh, et cetera. So it, it, the effort is to push them to maximal performance. Does that give you a little bit of information? Why is that called exam year? 
That's not called exam year. Uh, my question, what is, what is meant by exam year? I thought you asked the treadmill. What was the treadmill test? <laughs> It's the accent. <laughs> <laughs> well, now you know what the treadmill test is. <laughs> I've seen people getting tortured, yes. <laughs> By, uh, well, it, the exam year means the year that they were examined in the clinic. See, some of them were examined, the study started in 1970. So there were some in 70, 71, 72, and you can see some of these cohorts we had a group that were, you know, of all patients who had come to the clinic from 1970 to 1985, and then followed them for mortality after that. So exam year was simply the year that they had their exam. It's just to adjust. I don't think it's a big factor that needs adjustment, but it's to adjust for possible effects of different times. So it's, it's a simple adjustment. It's, it's not a highly significant uh, in my opinion, factor. Sorry. Don't let him a ask any more questions. Uh, again, another showing the data here and what my mentor, Dr. Paffenbarger, called the die-away curves. Uh, but this, uh, the outcome is digestive system cancer and fitness. And again, as I've already said, at the start of the follow-up period, there were no deaths because you just cannot get those dead people to go to maximal VO2. So they were all alive then, and people start to die. <coughs> not, not many die in the first year or two, and then some, you know, they begin to die. And the, the rate at which they die, or the, the number of which they die in these different groups, is how you create these survival curves, or Dr. Paff called them die-away curves. So you can see that the low-fit ones, the survival curve was significantly different than the moderate or high fit, so that, uh, they, again, they were dying at a faster rate uh, rather than just showing you the uh, um, death, death rate per, per year. And this was um, a, a note here, um, all uh, digestive system cancer mortality. I should have mentioned, why did, normally I put more introductory slides in there, but uh, we uh, obtained you know, continue to follow these people through many methods, determine who died through, again, many methods. And those who died, we obtained their death certificates from the state in which they died. So we, and the, in the U.S. at least, maybe you do something <coughs> like that here. When somebody dies, the doctor writes primary cause of death. Stupidity. Oh, no, <laughs> something. Yeah, the guy that can't answer questions. <laughs> but the primary cause of death, stroke. Uh, lung cancer, secondary cause of death, could be something else, and even tertiary causes of death. And uh, so that, that is how these different causes of death are determined. It's from uh, the physician, the person's physician, who signed the death certificate and said, yes, this, this woman is dead. And what he or she decided was the cause of death. Is that 100% perfect? No, right? Sometimes docs might, might get it wrong, but it's, it's a standard measure, and it's, I'll tell you, it's probably, well, it's really accurate that they're dead, I'll tell you that. <laughs> Let's uh, take, take a look now at uh, some people uh, in, I used to call it the prime of life. We need to repeat this research with uh, changing this to 75 instead of 60 if I'm going to call it prime of life, but you know, these are babies. But uh, May Sue, my colleague, has worked with me for many years, uh, <clears throat> published this uh, uh, several years, 10 years ago now. Uh, men and women's, whoops, what dummy made this slide? No, well, it wasn't me. Let's see, I'll, I'll blame my granddaughter. Uh, over 60 or older. Uh, nearly a thousand died during 14 years of follow-up, and these death rates are adjusted by these um, uh, factors that you see uh, here. And note that in the different age groups, again, low, moderate, high fit, and note that those the men and women who were 80 and older, who were high fit, were half as likely to die as those who were 60 to 69 who were low fit. Fitness, 20, 25 years of aging, yeah. 
Now, there are a couple of you in the room, at least, yes, who uh, you know you're going to die, right? Yeah. You know you're going to die. And those, and I, you don't know you're going to, you kids, you know, well, I'm not going to die. So we get to a certain, we know we're going to die. We'd like to delay it for a little while. <laughs> Let's not today. Not, not today, right. <laughs> yeah, we would like to. <laughs> we would like to kind of delay it uh, for, for, for some That's time at least. But are there things you fear more than dying? <laughs> she, she sat next to me. <laughs> well, I mean, I, I don't mean to make too big a joke of it, but frankly, I'd rather die than become severely demented. I'd rather die and become severely demented. So uh, in addition to living longer, living better is something that's, uh, that's important. And note again from, uh, these are, yeah, dementia listed on the death certificate, again adjusted for all, all these things. Uh, the low fit ones, much more likely to have dementia written on the death certificate as a cause of death. So uh, yeah. I want to live a little longer, but boy, I want to stay healthy and uh, what uh, using uh, this. <laughs> yeah, and it's always a pleasure to, to come here to Poland to give these talks. <laughs> okay, back again to old people. Uh, this is not our research, but I, I kind of like it because, well, the Grim Reaper is a friend of mine. He, <coughs> he provides these uh, participants for, for our research, or the endpoints for the, in the participants. <coughs> I like this study that this group did uh, several years ago in the uh, BMJ. Uh, older men, 70 and older, 17, well you can all read, uh, followed them up for almost 60 months and measured their usual walking speed. Now again, some of you who are doctors, I know you were thinking, we can't do a treadmill test and determine everybody's fitness and blah, 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 takes too much time. And well, you think you could do a six meter walking test? And this is not the only study that shows, you know, even, even six meters walking. And big studies in the U.S. that have shown this is related to health. So, I mean, this, okay, this is kind of a measure of, uh, of, of, of fitness. So, in this analysis, the men who walked less than 0.82 meters a second were 1.23 times more likely to die. Now, death's preferred walking speed you know, this guy, and my calculation is, is something like uh, less than two miles an hour. So that's maximal walking speed in this study was approximately three miles. So if you can continue to walk three miles an hour, the Grim Reaper can't get you. How about that? <laughs> yeah, you know, I'm kind of joking with this, but it, I mean, the, these are data from a reputable study that again, walking speed is fitness. And in this group of older men, those who could kind of keep doing it were less likely to die. Uh, <clears throat> I know I'm, I've hammered away uh, entirely at fitness, uh, but uh, a few years ago we said, well, and we've, we've looked at you know, cholesterol and blood pressure and all these things uh, and adjusted for them over the years. But uh, Bob Ross had this uh, student who wanted to look at uh, uh, healthy eating patterns. And we do have dietary data not on everyone in the cohort, but on reasonably sizable number. So 13,000 she, she did in this uh, study from three-day dietary records. And she developed uh, an unhealthy eating index. And I don't understand any of this, uh, the details of how this was done. But you know, here's, here was the pattern of the unhealthy eating index. And note that there was a higher odds of mortality in those in the highest quintile, the top 20%, of the unhealthy eating index. So if you're at a really unhealthy eating index, you are more likely to die than those who are in the first quintile. And here is merging those data then with the fitness data. So this is the unhealthy eating index. I think these are probably thirds of, of her index, low, moderate, and high. So it's high unhealthy eating index, and then high, moderate, and low fitness. So high fitness, well, doesn't seem to matter a lot. Maybe, you know, maybe a little bit. Moderate, okay, looks like maybe the unhealthy eating index is kind of adding something here to the risk of dying. And uh, 
Uh, I would say generally this shows the same in the low fit, that the higher your unhealthy eating index, you know, it's bad for you. So as I try to say in every lecture, I am a little crazy, low activity is the biggest problem, blah, 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 on and on and on and on. I do think healthy eating is important. Eat your fruit and vegetables. Eat a variety of foods, etc. Whatever your grandma tells you to do. Now, there is another kind of fitness, of course, that we could consider. And <clears throat> muscular strength. So in uh, this cohort, uh, we have a subset of individuals who had their strength measured in the laboratory. Again, not asking them to, to go to the gym and do whatever. Uh, measured their strength in, in the laboratory. <coughs> Put the data together from the upper body and lower body strength measures and, uh, you know, the statisticians squash all this stuff together and et cetera, et cetera. And uh, I think we, yeah, thirds of the composite score uh, were used in, uh, in, in the analyses. And here for thirds of muscular strength and mortality, well, get out of that bottom third, looks like it might be good. Get out of, for all-cause mortality, get out of the bottom third, looks like it might be good for CVD mortality. And I'm sorry for... I can't remember these papers, but I'm pretty sure, yeah, I'm, I'm pretty sure these data are adjusted, again, for all the kind of standard things that, that we typically do. And I think this study also, I think another, another study, I'll show you, I know we did this, adjusted also for cardiorespiratory fitness. So in the work we've done over the last 10 or 15 years, looking at this measured strength, measured strength is really strongly related to maintaining performance. That is, ability to get up, take yourself to the toilet, put on your clothes, take a bath. Uh, muscular strength is an important predictor of that. And we, we published some on that uh, quite a few years ago. So it's important for performance, and is it important for health? And I have, from, from looking at all of our studies over the years, I would say, well, muscular strength is important for health outcomes. Cardiorespiratory fitness is important for health outcomes. So if you consider two concentric circles, they overlap a little bit, but they don't, one doesn't eliminate the other. Both are important and have shown that in a number of studies. Uh, here's uh, strength uh, uh, adiposity and cancer mortality. And again, same uh, uh, strength measures. Yeah, and these are adjusted for cardiorespiratory fitness and number, again, are you getting sick of seeing these trends? Get out of the low, in this case, low strength group. So it's not only aerobic fitness, cardiorespiratory fitness, aerobic activity, it is resistance training as well. And I love, love this one. Well, I, I love all my slides, I mean, <laughs> love all my studies, but uh, you know, in, in this uh, group of uh, 1,506 men with hypertension, they all had physician-diagnosed hypertension. They were over 40 years of age. We followed them for 18.3 years, and not a huge number of deaths, but some, and again, measured the muscular strength and so forth. The hypertensive men with higher muscular strength had lower risk of mortality. And when we add cardiorespiratory fitness to this model, okay, I know you statisticians, this trend is no longer statistically significant. I'm going to say it's still clinically significant. There is still, and note that this is, the high fit group is substantially and highly statistically <coughs> a lower than, than the low fit group. So again, hypertensive men with high strength are less likely to die, even after you adjust for their cardiorespiratory fitness. I guess that means <coughs> and it would be good for hypertensive people to do resistance exercise, wouldn't you think? Now I'll bet you there are lots of physicians in this town, this country, and even probably two in the United States who tell their hypertensive patients, don't lift, don't strain, it's, 
he'll kill you. Well, I don't think so. Do resistance. Now, what physicians and exercise trainers need to do is help everybody, not only hypertensives, know how to do resistance training to reduce risk. And, and we'll have a lecture on that in a little bit later, right? You can tell them that. Uh, but uh, don't say, well, you've got this, so you can't do exercise, you can't do resistance training. Um, I don't quite believe that. Okay, how about obesity? And those of you who heard, how many were at my lecture the other day? Oh my God, most of you. Well, no need to give you this test again, but some of you weren't here. Those of you who weren't here, which one of these women is overweight by traditional BMI standards? Shout it out. You people were here last time and you saw the answer. So, I mean, this woman is overweight and this woman is obese. Okay, she's got kind of bigger hips and all of that. Okay, this woman, yeah, she's obese. But my, my point of this is these BMI <coughs> cut points, I think, are very nearly useless for clinical applications. Maybe for big epidemiology tracking, a surveillance in the population, that, that's another thing. They, they should not be used in, in clinical settings. I mean, it's just they're, they're, they're useless. Because, well, I, I, okay, I mentioned this, didn't I? The, the JAMA rejected my paper some years ago to publish the report on uh, obesity in the National Football League. Did I mention that? No. Oh, okay, well, I'll tell you that. They reject my paper to publish this report on our National Football League. Real football. <laughs> so you maybe have seen, seen some of these games. And you know what they found? 95% of the NFL players were overweight. I think it was <coughs> something like 50% of them were obese. Now, do you ever watch our NFL games? and get them on TV a little bit here? Yep. Okay, occasionally you see a guy with a belly even bigger than mine. But they're not overweight because they're fat. Why are they overweight? <coughs> Muscles. So to call that, you know, use those BMI categories and say, well, my God, Mr. Lineman, you're, you're obese. Oh, it's unhealthy. What are we going to do for you? Even though his, <coughs> I apologize. <coughs> even though his percent fat may be even lower. And that, but they did stimulate me to, and I got a $5 million grant. I'm going to study the National Basketball Association players. <coughs> and the $5 million I'm just going to put in my retirement account. Because <laughs> I already know the answer. What's the answer? They're tall. Football players are big, basketball players are tall. <coughs> no, I'm sorry. Anyone bring a bottle of scotch? <laughs> yeah. And I showed this the other day, so I'll go through it very quickly. Overweight is good for you. The U.S., 86,000 fewer deaths a year in overweight compared to normal weight. About the same number of deaths, fewer deaths than the more deaths in class 2 obesity. So don't just believe all of this stuff you hear again and again in the popular media, the scientific <coughs> and medical press about overweight, overweight, overweight. And the media likes to say, and I think it's similar here, uh, in the U.S., two-thirds of Americans are overweight or obese. Let's make the number as big as we can. Even though overweight really is not, well, no, wait a minute, overweight is a problem for some people. <coughs> if you're trying to get a date and take that really cute girl to some place, if you're kind of an overweight guy, you're probably going to have a little more difficulty than if you're like this skinny, powerful, muscular guy here. So, <laughs> Talk a little bit about fitness, fatness, and health. Uh, we started work, uh, whoops. Well, okay, this is not, not the start. Uh, this is a group of men uh, with physician-diagnosed type 2 diabetes. The outcome is death from cardiovascular disease. 
sorted into normal weight, overweight, or obese categories, low, moderate, high fitness. Now there aren't a lot of obese guys who are high fit, so we combine the moderate, high fit categories. That's the way epidemiologists work. Like we just scratch those categories today. Can you name one obese guy who is high fit? No! Oh, yes, give me, yes. <laughs> so look at this. All of them have diabetes. These guys are overweight or, or these guys are obese. And if they're at least moderately fit, you know where I'm going with this? Look at the difference in risk of cardiovascular disease mortality. You're better off to be obese and to be at least moderately fit if you want to avoid dying of heart disease. Uh, I really like this paper May published a few years ago in, in what I then called Prime of Life. So this is, is showing in fifths of fitness, so 20% in each group. Uh, so this is the low fit category as I've been talking about it uh, all afternoon or all, is it evening? I guess it's evening. Uh, again, get out of the bottom 20%. This would be the moderate fit category, and there, you know, there's a continued little bit of a trend, but this certainly in individuals 60 and older. And you combine the data here, so these are the fit ones, at least moderately fit. <coughs> <coughs> these are the normal fat ones, and these are the obese ones. And note that this is not BMI, this is percent body fat measured in the lab. Here are the unfit ones, normal fat, over fat, or obese. It's fitness that's important, not fatness. Hallelujah. Thank God. You say, yeah, well, I do like my own data in this case for sure. But um, there, there are other studies, and here's a recent one from some uh, colleagues um, uh, up, up in Detroit. And this, uh, you know, they have a big cardiac rehab program. Many of you probably know uh, Barry Franklin and, and his group. So this was looking at mortality after their first uh, heart attack. So, and again, exercise capacity measured in the lab. And just uh, quickly, uh, some women, um, more men, clinical exercise testing, categorized into METs achieved into these uh, different uh, categories. And early mortality was within, as you can see, these days uh, after the heart attack. And the results, a lot higher rates in those who had low fitness. So if you've had a heart attack, you're more likely to die if you have low fitness. Sorry. Yeah. But those are observational studies, and of course, how many times as, as an epidemiologist have I been criticized? Well, you can't believe observational studies. You gotta have randomized trials. So I am trying to raise $100 million <laughs> because we need to do a randomized trial, and I've got a bunch of middle schools in the United States identified, and we're gonna randomly assign half of them. To, it's gonna kind of be a prison. and it will be no cigarettes in that place. And then in the other one, there are going to be cigarettes all over the place. The kids are going to be forced to smoke. We're going to blow <laughs> smoke through the vents. And in 30 years, we'll know whether smoking causes lung cancer. We don't have any randomized trial on smoking and lung cancer. I could, well, anyway, being a little stupid here. So here's our dose response to exercise women. Again, Tim Church really did this. Uh, uh, I, I'm, I am really proud of the study. Uh, 430, what well, you can all read, postmenopausal, overweight, mildly hypertensive women. Four kilocalories per kilogram per week is probably not a number that many of you have used or, or are familiar with, but we came up with this approach because I, I do think when we talk about a lot of different things, we do need to keep in mind body size. So calories and exercise per kilogram of body weight per day, per week, what have you. <coughs> and in our calculations, uh, this, 8 kkw, <coughs> is the physical activity recommendation, 30 minutes a day for five days a week. So one group got half the recommended dose, recommended dose, and one group got one and a half times the dose. 
Now, Tim did such a lousy job of adherence in this study. Again, 430 women, three groups, all exercise in the lab, measured every heartbeat, every step, every watt, all of it in the lab. We knew whether they were there or not for a six-month trial. And look at this. Look, look at how many were below 90% out of the 430. I don't know whether they have the average on here or not. Yeah, 227 had 100%. That is meeting their goal of calories per kilogram per week. So I know we have some students in here. I throw down the gauntlet. Beat that. 100% adherence, 227. So anyway, I, I'm proud of what Tim and the, I can take no credit for this, but Tim and the staff. Here are the results. The primary outcome was VO2 max. Control group lost a little over the six month period. This group, that 5% difference, and these are all statistically significant, so a real gradient. So doing even half the recommended physical activity dose, you get an improvement, 5% improvement. Okay, do the dose and you get this amount and so forth. And a paper I really like from this that Corby Martin uh, did uh, a few years ago uh, is using quality of life, because we had some quality of life data in this study. And here is uh, uh, the mental health subscale from change quality of life. You know, these are all significantly different from control. Yeah. And the one I really like is change in energy. <coughs> They're energetics. I feel I've got more energy. So even doing just this amount, this 4 kkw, you f these women felt more energetic. Now, a few years ago, I had a fellowship at the Technical University of Munich, and one of the trips over there, they were having a meeting on exercise and cancer, and uh, Martin Holly asked me if I would come to a press conference the day before. I said, well, I'm not sure how much value I'll be unless they want to hear beer bitte. But uh, anyway, so I went to the press conference, and Martin whispered in my ear. They had an old man that had had prostatectomy and an old woman that had had breast cancer, a, a surgery. And the reporters were asking him questions. And they she, when the woman talked, she was just excited and so on. And Martin said, okay, this woman had congenital hip defects. She was sedentary her whole life. She had breast cancer. And then the surgeon that he was working with did the, the breast, uh, what's, the, what's the right word? Mastectomy. Mastectomy. God, thank you. Uh, mastectomy. And then this surgeon refers his patients into Martin's lab. It's cardiac rehab, cancer rehab, and Martin pushes them hard, and they work hard. And he said, she just is energetic because she feels, she's, she is much more fit, feels better. And that was kind of when a light bulb went off in my mind. Will his exercise program make her live any longer? Well, hopefully. But if it doesn't, it's still darn good for her because she's so much more energetic. And, and we saw that uh, in, the, in the Drew study. And I think maybe this is the last study I'll finish up here shortly. Uh, lifestyle in, uh, in interventions and independence for, for elders. Uh, we started this study a long time ago with a pilot and then uh, did uh, a multi-center randomized trial comparing physical activity or health education control in reducing major mobility disability. And the geriatricians running in this study Major mobility disability is inability to walk 400 meters in 15 minutes. Now that's not doing much sprinting, is it? Inability to walk 400 meters. And the, the geriatricians say, when you can't do that, it's a catastrophic health event. You, you know, you can't go out, you can't take that girl out dancing and, and so on and so <laughs> forth. Can't do your groceries and, and, and so on. So here's the population. 70 to 89 years of age. I think the average age was about 79. We recruited those who were sedentary, and we confirmed that, uh, but they were able to walk the 400 meters at the start of the study. Short physical performance battery is a standard, any of you know what that is? It's, it's a standard test, it's what is, how many times can you stand up from a chair 10 times without using your arms, and here, here's the one well, I am 78, so I should get a break. Uh, how long can you, uh, can you stand 10 seconds like this? <laughs> Darn right. 
Can you stand 10 seconds like this? See my feet? Like it? I think I can do that. Now, can you stand 10 seconds with your feet like that? Yes, I can. <laughs> so it's items like that that uh, are used. And we recruited people who are kind of on the downward slope of, short phys of the physical performance battery. They did have to be able to talk, uh, read and write a little bit, and participate in the intervention. So the intervention, uh, or the outcome from mobility disability, and again, this is measured in, uh, I, don't know whether, I don't think this was our center, and, uh, but um, measured, you know, measured in the hallway of a hospital or medical practice, and these 220 <coughs> meters apart, and you have some young person go along with you, up and back, and up and back, and up and back. Here are the primary outcomes <laughs> published a couple of years ago, the persistent mobility disability, the physical activity group, or less active. Now, sure, these are old people and they were getting, you know, there were some events, but the difference here, 28% per, uh, higher risk in the health education group. There'll never be a drug that prevents mobility disability, 28% lower odds, as does, and the, the physical activity was mostly walking, but a little bit of using resistance bands and a little bit of balance training and a few things uh, like that. If you haven't seen this study, I do take a look at it. Did I give the reference of, yeah, it's uh, the primary outcome. Uh, here's the, the methods paper, primary outcome in uh, JAMA in June of 2014. So how do we deal with this non-communicable disease epidemic? Let's go on. More support for, you all heard me, many of you heard me last week. Let's spend some money, do more research. Now, attributable fraction, epidemiologists like to do this. It's an estimate of the number of deaths due to a specific characteristic. And this is based on how strongly is that characteristic related to your outcome, let's say mortality. And then how common is it? So let us say, uh, let us say that uh, Rolls-Royce automobiles are absolute death traps. I don't care. I've never been in one. Now, I know this guy's got two Rolls-Royces, and I'd be concerned about my friends who have them, but uh, suppose Toyota Corollas were death traps. So you see, the more in the population who have a risk factor, and then, so that's the prevalence of the condition, and how strongly is it associated. So in our population, these 50 some thousand men and women, uh, this uh, men and the women, the percentage of deaths that these calculations, these epidemiological calculations, based on the number of deaths expected in the low fit, and you can see all these other risk factors, all of these percentages are adjusted for age, exam year, they're separate for men and women, they're adjusted for all the other risk factors in this slide. The only thing that's even close is a 16 to 17 percent of the deaths, you can say, okay, they are attributed to low fitness in this population. The only thing that's close is hypertension in men. Look at obesity, diabetes. I mean, I'm not saying we should ignore these other things but they don't cause nearly as many health problems or deaths <coughs> as does low fitness, which is you get by inactivity, and most everyone in the room knows that uh, around the world, many, many different countries, and, and several years ago, the World Health Organization, I mean, these are very consistent recommendations that uh, for the average adult, 150 minutes a week and 10 minute bouts, you say, well, yeah, but I can't do 10-minute bouts. I can only do five-minute bouts and still get, okay, do that. That's better than not doing it at all. <laughs> and I'll bet his entire fortune that it'll still be beneficial. Yes. And uh, again, some resistance training, two days a week, and even those up in the prime of life. Yeah, let's, uh, in addition, do th these things, but in addition, do some balance. And I'm trying to get more balance, anyway, more balance. I am reasonably okay with resistance and I'm, did I tell you how good I am with uh, aerobic? 
when I was 70 on my birthday, July 4, that's when we threw you blasted people out, you remember. <laughs> I set a goal of 5 million steps a year. And I record my steps every day, keep a spreadsheet, and I've hit my 5 million goal every year. I'm now well into my 78th year, and I'm well ahead of schedule, even though this week has been awful. So you set 5 million steps a year, see, see, but anyway, 65, and I think that, that's a good enough. We all should have a target of how much, act, and if you don't like doing steps, then uh, do canoeing, or play tennis, or I don't care what you, swim, whatever. So anyway, we have these recommendations. We as, and some of you may just be public people not involved in exercise science at all, but we all need to push to get everybody in the world to achieving these recommendations. So here's a guy who is really committed to getting physical activity. He knows physical activity is good, and walking is his favorite activity. <laughs> that dog's gonna live a long time. Thank you. <laughs> Do you want me to take any questions? I'm, I'm willing to, yeah. So anyone like to start us off with a question? Adam. Hi, Sid. Thank you very much for that amazing talk. I would like to ask you a question. Um, and I would like to know, according to what you think or what you found in your research, what are the three most important areas that we should look at in, in future physical activity? The most Im three most important what? Areas of research. Oh, areas of research. Okay, go on then. <laughs> three most important areas of research. In physical activity research. For? For whatever you think. For exercise science or for? Physical for physical activity. Oh, well, again, all areas are, are important. Uh, I, I guess I think, uh, and you know, I've done research, epidemiology, randomized trials. I think we need more studies on how to get, you know, communities and populations active. And this is a line of research that's been growing around the world in the last several years. But what can we do to, to make a population, to, you know, a neighborhood or whatever, be more a school or a business? or some other organization, or a bunch of students. What can we do to get them more? So I think more research into methods. And of course, I am not opposed to more physiology, learning more about the mechanisms, more about the details. And many of you probably know about the HIT activity, high intensity interval training. I'm less skeptical of that now than I was when it first started being mentioned. But I think more research on you know how can we combine intensities, intervals, and those things on various physical activity outcomes, whether it's uh, uh, cardiorespiratory fitness or blood pressure or lipid levels or something else. So th there's a lot yet to do. And I do like the behavioral research. If some of you are psychologists, how do we persuade people to adopt these behaviors and get the 150 minutes a week? Okay, Jack. Hi, um, uh, I'm a public health specialist, um, and alcohol is one of the areas that I'm kind of uh, involved in looking at. And I, I see you do like the you know, drink. Uh, the evidence in terms of how protective uh, this activity is around in, in reducing risk for people who drink over the limit, is that strong? Is that something that you've looked at? Well, yeah, look, I mean, I, I've been drinking quite a lot of vodka <laughs> here tonight. And uh, no, I, I haven't really uh, studied that. Uh, I think it is an area that we probably need more research. I mean, obviously, alcohol abuse is a health problem, and some people have it. And would physical activity help? I mean, there's there's an answer to the earlier question. That would be really interesting. How, how, how about do a study? There, was, there is a few studies I've, I've seen. I wasn't sure how, whether you guys would pick it up because you've got such a great cohort. Yeah, I I, I haven't uh, looked at that and. I mean, no, we, we did, one of my colleagues when I was in Dallas, uh, physical activity and people with uh, physician psychiatric diagnosed uh, depression. And people with, you know, cardiac rehab has been around since we were kids. But, uh, and can cancer rehab is there, but what, there are a lot of conditions. Uh, now, we did a, a big multi-center trial. I say we, uh, Maduka Trevetti, who's one of the leading psychiatrists in depression, uh, studies at uh, University of Texas Southwestern uh, Medical Center in Dallas led the effort, but we had something like five centers around, around the country. People 
who had been convicted of drug abuse were randomized to come into a center and do some exercise under supervision and get trained to try to keep it uh, keep up their activity and we thought it might help keep them from abusing again and I'm not sure whether we've finished the analysis in the publication but I don't think the results are quite as exciting as we, we hoped they would be. But yeah, let's, let's look in different populations. Professor Jonathan Long, I was still at the front end, has a question for us. Mm -hmm. Well, you are concerned about dementia, because uh, I worry about my future. Yes. Um, when, you, when you had your data up there, it seemed to imply that um, people in the high fitness category, which, as you remind us, is the, own, you know, the top 40%, so they're not really fit. Yeah. Well, it's, um, they're not unfit. Have higher levels, they're not high fit. have higher levels of the likelihood of developing dementia than those in the moderate group. So should I be toning down my physical activity? Well, good question. I don't or, know. or is it because the fit group has survived and the others have already yeah. died off? Yeah, excellent question, John. And I don't know. I mean, again, observational data, fairly small uh, study. Uh, I think... Uh, this is an area where we need to do some more research. I mean, overall, it looked like the, the more fit people were less likely to have the doctor write dementia on their death certificate. But there's a lot more detail that needs to be dug into on that topic, I think. But uh, I am pretty confident that being active and fit prevents a lot of other things and maintains function. So until we get that research, deciding whether or not it really affects dementia. Keep doing it anyway, there are a lot of other benefits. But it, ex excellent point. We, we need, need research on that. You kids out there, God, there's a lot of stuff to be done. Can we take a, a final question uh, from the front here? Uh, our guest friend. Yeah, I'm just wondering, with your presentation this evening being such full, full of passion, um, we all know the impact that the research has had, and with so many young academics, students in the audience, what would you say are the kind of three secrets to such a successful, passionate, enthusiasm career? You mean for my secrets? Yeah. How I've had a little success? Well, as I said the other day, growing up on a farm in Kansas and riding a pony to country school. <laughs> so can you do that? <laughs> uh, <clears throat> I have talked to some students here, uh, graduate students here uh, this week, and what I like to tell my students, or them, or even old, old guys, is well, <laughs> think critically and challenge. Challenge me, challenge him, challenge whomever. Challenge what's out there. And, well, guys, I wonder if that's true. Is the data really convincing? Uh, what about if? And think of creative new ways to to look at questions and, and find things you do that are, you like you think are fun, uh, that's also true. But you know, stay with it, keep punching, and uh, when you get those data, you find a really smart person to help you analyze them, of course. <laughs> and uh, well, this is or, actually this is my this is my biggest solution. You know who i some of the people I've worked with: Tim Church, May Sue, T. C. Lee. Uh, Bill Cole on down there, you find those really clever people. <laughs> Suck up to them and say, hey, how, how'd you like to work with me on this project? And I, seriously, finding a great team to work with is important. People with different backgrounds and different ideas. And so creativity, finding good collaborators, and work hard. Okay. That's it. It's a very optimistic and worthwhile ending. Uh, just to conclude events, just to thank Steve very much. Uh, Steve will be leaving us tomorrow. Uh, for colleagues who are internal, uh, there will be a question and answer session tomorrow afternoon. If you'd like to come on, get some more information about either the research or the approaches that Steve's just been advocating. But for now, we hope not for the last time, but thank you Steve once again. Uh, if we could show our appreciation in the usual way. Yeah. Thank you.